man, I got to tell you, I was feeling, uh, it's kind of crazy yesterday watching this CM Punk interview. <laughs> I was really blown away. First of all, he doesn't do media like this very often. So it was a big deal that he was there and I'd heard it announced a week or so before or whenever, but I just kind of didn't assume that they would get into the nitty gritty as much as they did. But boy, did they shout out to Ariel Hawani for a fantastic interview. Shout out to CM Punk for being as honest as he could. There were only a two, a couple of chance, a couple of times I'll get it out. But he had to reference that NDA that he signed for brawl out. Couldn't answer questions about what exactly happened with that. Or even about his dog, Larry's involvement in that as silly as all that sounds, but you saw the interview. what did you think? What was your takeaway from Ariel and CM Punk on the MMA hour? First of all, Ariel's, you know, in a class all of his own. He's, he's really good at what he does. Yes. You know, and when you watch an interview that sounds like just two guys shooting, shooting the shit at the bar and you just happen to be able to overhear it, that's a good interviewer. That's the way yeah. that felt. Um, I was surprised given all of the discussions about non-disparagement agreements and non-disclosure agreements. Both of them, you know, are NDAs, but given so much of that chatter, I was really shocked that punk would come out and talk about anything other than WrestleMania. It feels like a new WWE. Cause I, th I thought the same thing. Like they're not going to talk about all the AEW stuff. It's going to be, this is an appearance that was booked because they knew people would tune in and then we're going to plug WrestleMania. And we did, but boy, we got a lot more than that. We're going to do some quotes here from CM Punk in this interview with Ariel Hawani. Here's what he had to say about Tony Khan quote. I don't like the drama, but the truth is the truth. He is not a boss. He's a nice guy. Ultimately that is a detriment to the company, but it's not my company. I'm an outsider. I thought I was brought in to sell merchandise and tickets and draw numbers for pay-per-view. I clearly did that, but that's not what the place is about. And some people didn't like that. What do you, uh, what do you think of that? He's not, he's a, not, he's a nice guy, but he's not a boss. Like you know, I have echoed many times here, that same sentiment that Tony Khan is a nice guy. He is a huge wrestling fan. He wants what's best for wrestling. I really do believe that. But punk says yesterday, he's not a boss. And then on the same day, I'm not saying the two are related. We see at least 10 people released from AEW. That's kind of some boss behavior. Maybe. What'd you think of, uh, this punk comment that he's not a boss? Well, I think that's been clear. I mean, look, I, I'm going to get this out of the way. I'm only going to say it once because when I heard about this interview and then I heard some of the feedback from it and I got phone calls from mutual friends of mine, ours, um, going, dude, you got to fire back. You get, you've got to use this, clip it up and use it on wise choices because it's custom built for you. And I was so excited. I had some dental work yesterday. I spent three hours in a dental chair. I had to have a, a uh, implant put in. Not fun. Right in the middle, right in the front tooth, right? That one right there. It's a temporary. But I didn't know how I'd feel when I got done. I didn't know if I'd have a head full of Novocaine and you know, eating pain pills. So um, I didn't want to book it, didn't want to commit. And I'm glad I didn't because when I sat down last night and watched it, what am I going to say other than, yep, <laughs> yeah, yep, been talking about that for three years, yep. Now, I don't have any perspective on what Tony's like backstage. I get a glimpse, like a brief glimpse, almost like a drive-by, right, which doesn't really tell you anything. Um, <clears throat> so I don't really know what he's like backstage, but if you look at the patterns, dot, 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 connect the dots, ooh, there's a picture pattern at least of everything that we've seen for the last year, two years, three years have all indicated that Tony just is not a leader. How many times have I said it on this show and upset you or been put in my place? Sometimes appropriately so, but it's just obvious when you see how the lack of leadership manifests on a regular basis. And there's a lot of chatter that, you know, we don't talk about here. I don't talk. I don't even bring it up. Because we all know people that work in close proximity, in some cases inside AEW. So we all know kind of what's going on, or at least we were told what's going on backstage. There's a 
an impression that one has just if you know people that know somebody. But you also look at, like I say, some of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years. The, the punk situation is probably the most obvious. That's lack of leadership. I talked about it on 83 Weeks. I talked about it on Strictly Business. And then I get crucified. He's just an old man. He's bitter because Tony Khan won't give him a job. Are you fucking kidding me? After the CM Punk interview, I'm way more convinced I'm 100% right that I would never want to put myself through that kind of drama. So... Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because Punk had you know Punk has a he has a much more unique perspective than I do. I've walked through the building twice during production and had a brief impression, but Punk was there for a few months. So interesting comment, but not surprised. When you finished the interview, you know you were pretty critical multiple times on this podcast about Punk. And then when he came back to WWE. You know, you talked about how cool that was and you were happy he was back and blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people were saying, were crying foul saying, wait a minute, you were just critical of punk. And now you're sort of promoting his t-shirt on social media. And then some of that was because we have an affiliate relationship with fanatics, but I'm curious, did your opinion change of the real life Phil Brooks, seeing him talk about his AEW experience and seemingly a lot of your feelings align with him? No. Now, let me explain. If you go back and listen, if, 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 one, if one of our listeners or viewers are out there <clears throat> that really wants to try to grind me up on so social media, go back and look at some of the comments or listen to some of the comments that I made about Punk um, right before his debut in AEW. You know what you're going to find? Probably nothing. Because I didn't have an opinion of Punk going into AEW, at, at least not as well, not whether or not it was going to be a huge success or not success. I don't think I, I, I had no feeling about it. I had no, not connected to it at all because I've never met punk. I don't know punk. I've never worked with punk. The only thing I know of punk is that at one point he was a major player in WWE. So therefore he's got equity. That's all I knew about punk. You won't, and if you go back and listen to some of my comments, probably within the first week or two after Punk's arrival, I didn't say much until Punk, I take that back, shortly after Punk made his debut. In his opening interview, big time, back on television, Punk is trying to get his heat by burying Hulk Hogan which is such an internet mark thing to do. That's like the lowest hanging fruit. It's there's cheap heat. And then, and then there's like heat that's so cheap. It's it doesn't have any value. And when you go out and try to get yourself over by catering to the internet audience and burying a guy, you don't know. You have no idea what kind of human being. Jerry Belay is. You may think you do because of what you've read and, and horrible situations he's put himself in, but that's not necessarily an indication of who he is, and you don't know who he is. But you're willing to pass judgment. I got a little bit of a problem with people that are so comfortable passing judgment on what someone is like. And, and so I got, I, I got vocal about that. I pointed that out. It's cheap. It's the cheapest, no talent heat thing to do that I could possibly think of for a character at the level of CM Punk and the anticipation he brought with it. And shortly after Punk made a comment and I called it out. And of course, because of that I was called a hater and a frustrated old man who can't get a job working for Tony Khan. And then shortly after Punk came out and he made similarly, stupid comments about how he and I don't know if it was Brian Downson or somebody else, you know, being now in AEW is the equivalent of, you know, Hall and Nash, only better. Really? A hell of a statement to come out and make, try to get yourself over. So those, those kind of things put a bad taste in my mouth. And I don't mean because I was angry or jealous, but I mean, as far as how I viewed him 
not as a human being, because I've never had a syllable of conversation with the man, but as a performer and to an extent a character, not just athletically a performer, but the character, if the character has to, after seven years off or whatever it was to come back and have to rely on cheap heat to get yourself over and then put yourself over guys like Colin Nash with the impact that they had in the NWO, because Punk thought he was good, he and his bandits were going to be bigger than the NWO. That just made me go, now this guy doesn't have a clue. He's catering to the internet. He's, 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 he's reaching for the low hanging fruit. Beyond that, the only negative things I've said about Punk is he's not going to move the needle. I said that early on from the get go. And it's because I'm a hater and I can't get a job for Tony Khan and I'm just bitter. No, I like talking about wrestling, especially about a guy sometimes who has come out and said that he knows more about professional wrestling than Ted Turner, if Ted would have been around, or if Tony would have known half as much or 1% as much as Tony Khan, WCW might still be around. Okay, say stupid shit like that. <clears throat> I'm going to come at you. And Tony has continued to make a lot of those statements, some, you know, more ver verbose or some, some more outside the box and others. But yeah, I'll have fun with that. I won't take it seriously. I'm not going to go home and cry. I'm not going to kick my dog because of it. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to have some fun with it. But the only thing that negative thing that I said about Punk probably after all that was just, he's not going to move the needle. And guess what? He didn't. Not Punk's fault. Not Mercedes Bonet's fault. Not Okada's fault. Not Osprey's fault. Not, not Edge's fault or whatever he's called now. <laughs> you know, not Christian Cage's fault. It's not the fault of the talent that nobody's getting over. It's that the, there's no creative. It's just a wrestling exhibition with, with an angle as an excuse. Let's talk about what he said about, uh, the Jack Perry circumstance quote, Tony's big idea was separate shows. We're going to separate everybody. I said, that would never work. Just let me go. Who cares? It's best. These guys don't want me here. This isn't a real business. This isn't a business predicated on making money, drawing money, selling tickets. It's not what it was sold to me as let me go. The second day we had this show, I'm sitting in catering and Tony Schiavone comes to get me. He says, Jack is cussing me out. He cussed out Mike Mansuri. He's cussed out the doctor right now. I was told people were being separated. So there's not problems. So you don't want me in this. You all need to handle this because if you don't, I'm going to handle this and you're not going to like how I'm going to handle this. I don't know anything about Jack being on vacation. There are people that work one day a week and don't want to, and they want to show up, wrestle and film vignettes and then sit at home for weeks. Do what you want. It's not my company, but not on my show. What Jack wanted to do was he wanted to smash the window of a rental car with a pipe. I was like, Doc's told you no, Daryl's told you no, Mike's told you no, Shivani's told you no, and apparently you've cussed them out. So I'm telling you no, we don't do that here. So if you want to do that, go to Wednesday and do it. To come to this show and everyone's supposed to be separated to get rid of all the drama, and you're swearing at the doctor because it's real glass, it's going to get in your eye. There's a safe way to do that. And I politely said that to him. I said, this is a different show. If you want to do that, go to Wednesday. He clearly took something very business minded, very personal, <laughs> which is fine because I've done that before too. And it's very much who he's friends with and shit never got squashed. Nobody's in charge. And it turned into what it turned into. So he sort of told the whole story of what ultimately led to him leaving AEW. But I think the thing that struck me the most is the way he started. These guys don't want me here. This isn't a real business. This isn't a business predicated on making money, drawing money and selling tickets. That's what it was sold to me as let me go. And you and I have sort of discussed this in a different way where you would get on here and be critical of AEW quote unquote flatlining. I'll never forget that conversation because I said, you know, another way of saying that would be the ratings are stable. But you have a growth mentality. We both do in our real life and sales and whatnot. We want to get bigger. We want to make more. We want to 
have more downloads and sell more merch and sell more tickets and sell more mortgages or whatever I'm selling. I'd like to do more of that. And it felt like at different times, AEW was kind of flat and you called it flatlining. And I just said, it comes down to, and this is a phrase I've learned in recent years, goal alignment. It doesn't feel like WWE's goal and AEW's goal are the same. And maybe that's what has tripped punk and, and maybe some others up, but what do you make of him saying this isn't a real business? Let me, let me first off, I want to kind of tag the first question you asked me and my thoughts about punk. And if they had changed the reason my thoughts hadn't changed is I really didn't have any thoughts about Phil Brooks. Yeah. Person. I didn't know him. Didn't have feeling one way or the other. My feeling about him as a character at the time in AEW has not changed clearly. Now, now, and if you, again, go back and listen to some of my comments when the rumors were floating around <clears throat> that Punk may go back to WWE, I think it was on Strictly Business. I said to Alba, because Alba asked me, how do you think he would do that? I said, I think he'd do fine there because he's not going to be the guy. He's going to be a part of a team and a well-organized team, a, a well-managed team, and a team with structure and leadership. It's ex almost exactly what I said. So that's the difference between the things that Punk said in AEW, which I still think is low-hanging fruit, the things that I reacted to and, and just cheapened his, his appearance for me and my impression of him as a character. Now, after listening to this interview, the person I'm hearing, Phil Brooks, is somebody that I would, you know, I don't, it's never going to happen likely, but sit down, you know, have a steak with that guy. Sure. Because a lot of what he said is rooted in common sense, right? It's not a radical theory folks. It's just basic fundamental business and especially wrestling business. Um, the idea now let's go back to his comment. The idea that <clears throat> Tony's solution to a, personnel problem was to separate them without addressing the problem <laughs> says everything you need to know about whether Tony Khan actually knows how to run a business. It's that was a, that was a move. I, I mean, I, I don't even want to try to make a comparison. That is such a bizarre failure of management one-on-one talent relations, common sense, you know that's not going to work. And this Jack Perry dude, <clears throat> why? Just why? <laughs> why would you have someone around who has that little value but creates that much drama and is that much of a diva? I don't get it. I can see, I can see, yeah, what are the reasons, if I ever had that stake with, I was like, how, how the hell did you last there as long as you did? I still disagree with the way he conducted himself at the press conference. That's just me and the way I do business. Like, keep your shit backstage. Don't put it out in the public. Don't negotiate in public. Don't fight in public. But how he lasted as long as he did is mind boggling to me because it sounds like it just sounds so, I mean, I'm, I can feel it. I mean, I've experienced it. I've, I've been in dysfunctional locker rooms. I oversaw one for a while. I know what it's like. I have empathy for Tony, except for the part where he doesn't do anything about it and decides he's going to keep everybody on separate sides of the room. <laughs> That's just silly. Especially when you don't book, when you're just throwing random matches together, you know, so that's never going to work. Not for more than two weeks. Well, we should talk about, even though he didn't say his name, he certainly hinted around and beat around the bush. Dave Meltzer a few times. He's talking about the, uh, the Mindy's all out press conference where he's eating the, the muffins and I'm old, I'm tired. And I work with children promo. <laughs> that was and a good line. Quote, Getting out there and seeing reporters that report shit about you like it's fact without ever checking with you 
who were openly friends with other wrestlers. It's just fucking high school clicky drama bullshit. I get there and see these goofs and I just, you know, lose my temper. Top three CM Punk promo though. And when I, when I heard that and I saw that in the interview, I thought, man, he's referencing Dave Meltzer as, and I'm sure he was referencing Nick Houseman being friends with Cole Cabana. And that's what set him off. And of course we know that there's some history with Cabana and, and punk. And he made it clear that he doesn't see a way past that. He's not going to speak to Colt without, unless there's a lawyer present. And we know that it's about to become, he said, she said with, uh, Dave Meltzer and, and CM punk. What'd you make of him going after wrestling journalists, calling them goofs, ring friends with wrestling. And that led to what he called a top three CM punk promo. Yeah, I didn't I didn't read that as him going after journalists. I read that as a shot right between the eyes at, at Dave Meltzer. Yeah. And I don't know why he didn't say Dave's name. He should, probably should have. Because there's a lot of other people out there that are writing and following wrestling and, and online that do a great job. So, you know, shout out to a lot of them. Just unfortunately, Dave Meltzer gives the rest of them a bad name. And I loved it. And I mean it's it's honest. Give him, give him credit for that, for sure. He's honest that he's 100% right. When you, God, when you read that back to me, it sounds like something I might have said, like almost word for word. It does. And, and, and so does this statement. If you're more happy with some goof saying you had a five-star match and the buildings are a quarter full, we're not in the same business. No. I mean, I, I don't want to put a smile on my face. I wish I would have said that one. I may have to steal it at some point. I'll wait till after people forget about it a little bit and I'll bring it back. Like, <laughs> sounds familiar, but I don't know who, I don't know where that came from. But I, I, I absolutely agree with it. Here's a guy, Dave Meltzer that I saw him be posted the other day. And again, I, I follow Dave just so I get a laugh, like throughout the day, if something's going wrong and I want to laugh, I'll look for a Dave Meltzer post. And he posted something the other day and said, Oh, the problem with, you know, AEW storylines is they throw so many of them at you. You can't focus on them. You fucking clown. He's not in the same business that the entertainment business is in, in general. Dave looks at wrestling from a unique perspective and his, his half, his glass half full glass, full glass, empty. Doesn't matter. As long as the wrestling, as long as the wrestling inside of the ring is good. And even that I question, I mean, some of his, you know, four or five star matches that he's put over recently, but I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I mean, it's, he's so irrelevant in so many ways, irrelevant in the sense that he's not connected to reality. You know, he talked, Dave Meltzer talks about, oh, I study the business. He's always studying something. Well, for a motherfucker that's supposedly a journalist, why don't you try studying grammar, you dipshit? Learn how to fucking write. And if you're going to be on camera, you know, learn how to talk. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 you know what I mean? Just give it a whack. You know, could could work out for you. But I think shining light on Dave Meltzer and what a fraud he really is in the sense that he has positioned himself because he got there first in a lot of ways. Credit to him for that. And he has been there for a long time, and he's convinced people that he knows and understands things that he doesn't have a clue about. And this is where the social media aspect of it gets fun for me, because when I read and follow the people that are kind of tagging into Dave's perspective on things, it's like, I wonder what these people do for a living, or what kind of a social life must they have? Because the just the... the, the the composite view of the people that support Dave Meltzer's perspective. It's like that group of kids in school that nobody wanted to associate with, like the nerdiest booger eating motherfuckers you can find just all hanging out together. Cause they're the only ones that can tolerate each other. That's what Dave and his little universe of shit stained dirt sheet writing fans are just, ugh. but I loved it. Put shine the light on it, and that's a great thing because Dave has had a platform for what 30 years now. More he can put time. all this stuff out there, he can say whatever he wants for decades. Nobody could really hold him accountable, even his talent. You don't have a platform, you're not going to go on television really and 
respond the way you really want to respond. You can take a little shot here and there, like Hogan did. You can do that, but it's you know that's not really the same thing as exposing somebody or responding to somebody in kind. And now that you know, Bruce and myself and Conan and so many other people, you know, Kevin Nash. Now that so many people that were actually in the business and actually know the stories behind the scene um, are out there, we can call him on his bullshit. And now more and more and more people are seeing. You know, that we were absolutely right. Just the other day, Coach Rosie, I think he's with us right now. Coach Rosie sent me a clip of Dave Meltzer talking about why I fired Ole Anderson. It was just like completely made up shit. Completely fabricated. But that's how Dave has gotten himself over by telling these stories that he convinces people are true that are figments of his or someone else's imagination. There's nothing remotely, not even close, happened. It was, it's, but no, I love it. I love that CM Punk's shining light on it. I, a lot of people are starting to call it Dave Meltzer, and pretty soon people are going to realize that if you will be out there supporting Dave Meltzer, you're one of those booger eating little kids no one wants to play with. <laughs> well, I guess I'm a booger eater because I still read The Observer. I appreciate yeah, it. But you, yeah, but <laughs> well, I, I understand that he doesn't get everything wrong. Uh, I had a chuckle and Lord, I'm friends with Dave and consider him a friend and appreciate the effort that he puts in, but occasionally it's something wrong. A couple of days ago, he was asked, what was the booking philosophy during the old odd times when Andre challenged for a title must be brutal, keeping him so strong while never giving him the belt. And Dave quote tweeted it and responded, Andre got a few title shots, not a ton, but had them with Bachwinkle, race, Anoki, Terry Funk and flair. Never with Briscoe or Vern that I can recall. Never in WWE. Bruno badly wanted to work with him, either as champion or post-77. Pitched Vince's father hard on it, but Vince's father told him he would never make the match. Felt he had two unbeatable baby faces and didn't want to hurt either. But then I couldn't help but go back to that part where he says, never in WWE. And I said to myself, self, <laughs> wasn't WrestleMania three kind of a big deal? Because that was a title shot. Like Andre, the promo that Bobby Heenan cut on on uh, Piper's Pit was about the fact that Hogan never got a title shot to Andre. So WrestleMania three, the biggest WrestleMania of all time, was a title shot for Andre. Not only that, the most watched match in the history of American television was a rematch of that match on NBC. Not Saturday night's main event, but the main event in prime time. <laughs> It's literally the most watched show match in the history of professional wrestling. And he says, well, no, he never got a title shot in WWE. Now I know Hogan beat him the first time and the million dollar man cheated and Andre won the second one. And we got the tournament for WrestleMania, but Andre got the title shot. So I'm saying all that to say as big of a supporter as I am of Dave every now and again, brother gets it wrong. That's okay. We've all been wrong before. It's not getting this kind of information right or wrong because to give Davis credit when it comes to history, um, I don't think there's anybody in the business that seemingly has information at his mental fingertips when it comes to the history of not only wrestling in the United States, but around the world. I would absolutely give Dave credit all in the world, all the credit in the world for that. And even with his unique abilities in that regard and the access he has to that information, whether it be packed away in his head or in that shit storm of an office I've seen pictures of, doesn't matter. You're going to get things wrong once in a while. That's a mistake, but intentionally fabricating, lying, lying by omission, that, that ain't cool. And I, I make mistakes every single day. Of course, we all do. You're going to continue making them, especially when you put out as much volume as, as Meltzer does. You're going to make mistakes. Mistakes aren't intentional. Lying is. Hurting people's careers by fabricating stories are. Posting fabricated stories as news is, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's where I can't be friends with someone like that. 
I, or I can't respect them at all because that's, that's the intent behind that is selfish and hurtful. And that ain't cool.